Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. How's everyone doing? Good. Good, good, good. Welcome to everyone joining us in VR. Welcome to everyone uh, joining us online as well. So good to be with you guys. Good to be with you after uh, being away for a couple weeks. But while I'm away, I just have to say, Pastor Jason brought it. He did great, didn't he? Woo. Give it up for Jason. I think he's back there. There he is in the back. Let's all just stare at him. No, he's, you did really well, man. Well done. Kudos to you. Now, I love that I can go away and, um, and I know you're not, getting, um, you're not getting the B team. You're really not. Um, you're, you're getting an, an A-plus quality uh, communicator at all times, and so I love that with all, all the people who teach here. Um, today, oh, well, let me just tell you, so I was away on, on vacay uh, a week ago. I was back, actually, last Sunday, but I, then I drove with my son. I went down, one of our former pastors planted a church down in Illinois. Uh, my son helps lead worship for them, and so I drove with my son down to Illinois. So I, I was up earlier than a typical Sunday morning, hopping in the car with my son at 5 a.m. to drive down to Illinois uh, to, uh, to, watch, to go to that church plant and enjoy being down there and seeing a bunch of old friends. So it was just fun uh, seeing them for a week and, and uh, celebrating what God's doing in, in their church plant one year in, and they're doing really well, and so it's, it's really sweet to just see how God uh, used, really Lakeland even, uh, as a part of their, their journey is, is fun. But last week, uh, yeah, while we were away on vacation, um, we, we go up to Lake Eagle River, that's where we go every year, and we just spend a, a week in the sun and in the water, and there's more boating and tubing and skiing and, and all this, and, and it's just a ton of fun. One of my favorite things to do is just to watch my kids make strides in whatever they're, they're, they're doing. To, to try something. They're, they get better at skiing, they get better at wakeboarding, they get better at wake surfing, they get better at falling off tubes, all that stuff. They get better at it all. And it's just, it's fun to watch that. And, and uh, one of the things that we'll do is we'll go to the ski show every year and um, we, we're decent skiers, decent enough that we now, we watch the ski show and as we're watching the ski show, we look at one another and we're like, we could do that. We could do that. And whatever we can't do, we're like, we should try that. You know, it's, it's that type of thing. And, and so one of the things I thought was pretty cool this year, uh, it was a new feat for us. We skied six kids behind the boat at the same time. And uh, yeah, it's fun. And last year we did five, this year six. I'm sure we could have done seven or eight, but we're pacing ourselves, okay? We've got, we've got well, room to grow. And so next year will be seven for sure. Uh, but that was just, it was, it's fun to watch them do do things, but I, I look at um, at our family. I'm like, we're just kind of ordinary people, but we like to ski, and so ordinary people doing kind of what is a little extraordinary. That's the type of thing that you'd see at a ski show. You put little flags in their hand, and you got it. So you're like done right there. And um, but I like that. I like it when it's like ordinary people doing pretty extraordinary things. And uh, and I believe that is actually true for all of us. That um, that's what we are actually wired to do as kind of ordinary people do extraordinary things for God. I read an article years ago about Mark Wahlberg films. If you know Mark Wahlberg, he's an actor, and he, about five years ago, he did a series of movies. They're all very different, but they all had thematically some of the same aspects of it, and this is what the, the author of the article was talking about. He was talking about how Mark Wahlberg, the reason why his movies are so successful is he plays ordinary people who become the heroes of these movies. So it's like Transformers where he's like this, he's an inventor, he's a mechanic. Uh, in Patriot's Day, he's a cop. In Deepwater Horizon, he worked on an oil rig, but he's just kind of a, the ordinary Joe Blow type guy. And yet he always finds himself in the situations where then he becomes the hero. And the guy who was writing the article was talking about this is why America flocks to the theaters to watch these movies is because average Americans are sitting there watching this and going, that could be me fighting with aliens against alien races, right? No, they, no one's thinking of that. But it is this idea of like, this could be me, an ordinary person doing something bigger than myself, bigger, bigger than me. And I believe it's actually something that we're all made for. I think it's a pattern, actually, of the story of God. We see all throughout scriptures how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And that's not a new phrase. I've used that many times before. Um, it's what we're actually looking at in this whole series, Big Dogs. We're looking at some of the big dogs throughout Scripture and how God used a lot of times these were ordinary men and women to do extraordinary uh, things. And if I could ask, though, a question of the big dog that we're going to look at today, here's the, the question I want us to tackle. It's this one. What common traps exist to rob us 
of the plan that God has for us. Kind of the big plan. If he's got a big, extraordinary plan, a big story that he's writing in our lives, are there common traps that exist to rob us? Because the big dog that we're looking at today, my wife already mentioned his name, Moses, there's multiple times that it, it appears like he's going to derail. There's multiple things that come against him that looks like he's going to miss God's good and big and huge plan uh, in his life. And so here's why I want to look at Moses today is because he actually walks in most of God's plan for his life, but he also, and this is why it's so worth looking at, he also misses out on part of it because of one of the traps that he falls into. And so I want us to hopefully see, are there some of these traps that perhaps will rob us of us being able to step into the extraordinary story, the extraordinary plan that God has for our life. And so here's the first one. Let me just give it to you, and then we'll dive into Scripture. The first thing that I would say uh, can rob us is this. It's your limitations in seeing the whole picture. The bigger picture of what God is writing, the bigger story that he's writing, it's our limitation of only seeing kind of what we can see in this. Now, here's why I say this. So let's go to Exodus chapter 2. If you're going to follow in your Bibles, that's where we're going to where we're going to be most the whole time in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2, we're going to read 10 verses. First 10 verses here that kind of set up the story, okay, of, of Moses' life. It says this. All right, here we go. <laughs> Exodus 2, 1. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby, and he kept him hidden for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, okay, but pause. Why in the world is she hiding her son? Well, she's hiding him because it's in a time period uh, when Pharaoh is actually killing all the newborns. And the reason why he's doing this is because the Israelite nation, the Hebrews, are becoming so numerous, they're becoming so many, that he's afraid that they're going to overtake him and overtake uh, the Egyptian nation. So he's like, oh, we gotta, we got to slow them down. And so he's killing all the babies. And so if you became pregnant in that day and age, you would just try to hide your baby for as long as you could. Maybe you could keep this baby under wraps, and, and no one would find out. Uh, she realizes she can hide him no longer, and so she comes up with a plan. She got a basket made of papyrus reeds, and she waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the banks of the River Nile. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do that, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. (laughs) Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother, and I'll even pay you for your help. So the woman took uh, the baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. And the princess named him Moses, for she explained, uh, or yeah, explained, I lifted him out of the water. So it's kind of interesting what happens here. Uh, Moses' mom, the plan is float my baby among the reeds uh, down by the River Nile. And honestly, her plan is I know the baby's going to be seen by some Egyptian person, somebody, and maybe, just maybe, uh, they'll have mercy on my child. And uh, it's not just some Egyptian uh, sees the baby, but it is the princess sees the baby. And then what an amazing way that this all plays out. Uh, his sister, Moses' sister, says, hey, do you want me to find someone to nurse the child? Yeah, okay, I'll let me, yeah, go find a woman. Okay, I'll go find mom, right? And then the princess pays mom to raise her own child. I mean, you talk about like, and, and then you might say, well, this is a horrible story because then once the child's nurse, once Moses is nurse, she has to give him over to the princess. But for for Moses' mom, this is probably like winning the lottery. They're they're like, yeah, my child will be well cared for, well educated, well taken care of, and and I got to raise my child as a young child and wasn't killed. Like this is all good things probably in, in their minds. But here's what's also interesting that we usually can't connect the dots of our backstory the way that God can connect the dots in his entire story that he's writing. 
Moses, he's an Israelite. While he lives in this time where all the kids are being killed, he ends up being raised in the Egyptian palace. Now here's the deal. There is no other person more perfectly suited for the unique assignment that's going to come toward Moses and come his way. He's uniquely an Israelite who's raised as an Egyptian. Like that's just kind of this bizarre blend that exists in nobody else and it's incredibly unique and the same is true for you not that you're a hebrew child raised by an egyptian home that's not your your thing but you have a very unique incredibly unique backstory that's entirely unique to you it's funny when my when my wife uh she's talked to us with her sisters over the years obviously they talk uh but they talked about their experience when they lost their mom uh, in a sudden car accident years ago. And it's amazing to me, one of the things that was kind of a, a weird, kind of bizarre aha moment is how these three girls who are only four years apart, all, you know, three girls within a four-year period of time, all had extremely different experiences in the loss of their mother. My wife and I, we were married when, uh, when her mom was killed. Um, her second sister was in college when her mom was killed, and the third sister was in high school. And they all had incredibly different experiences and emotions and processes. And they're like, man, my world was like this. And the other one's like, my world was like this. And the other one was like, mine totally different. And my, my wife was like, how is it possible that we all grew up in the same household? We experienced the same thing, even but just in slightly different seasons of life. And it took us entirely different. It nailed us entirely in different ways. And the thing is, it's true with you. Your backstory, even though you might have grown up in the same house as your siblings and things like that, your backstory is very unique to you. It's your, your family system, your home life, it's your friends, your city, your neighborhood, your surroundings, your likings, your life circumstances, your unique highs, your unique lows. They are all part of your backstory. And it's a backstory that God sees how it fits into a bigger story that he wants to write with you in the middle of it. Are you with me here? What the enemy will try to do is get you to view your backstory, though, like a limitation. Like, I'm the only one who went through this, and because this is my, my history, this is my experience, this is all the reasons why I'm disqualified for fill in the blank, whatever the kingdom assignment or God's bigger picture might be. It, it, he does it in such a way to try to discourage you, to get you to give up before you even begin. Moses probably felt like his backstory was a limitation. Why in the world would I say that? Because you'd say, I, I described it almost like he's winning the lottery, but he... While he's uniquely a Hebrew who's growing up in an Egyptian setting, he belongs to both worlds and yet feels like he belongs to neither. This is why I say that, because what we know what happens next, according to Scripture, is that he finds himself starting to feel pity for his own people. And so uh, he, one day he comes across a, a couple of, of his... Um, a couple Hebrews are being actually beaten by a slave driver. He gets in the middle of there, he, of that whole situation. He fights against the guard. He accidentally kills the guard. And you would think the Hebrew men that he's protecting would be like proud of him, but instead they're like, who are you? Like, you don't even belong with us. And they kind of turn on him. And so he's now afraid, like, the Hebrews don't trust me. The Egyptians don't trust me. And he feels like he has no one. And so he ends up running. But what you need to know is that everything that's a part of your backstory is part of making you perfectly poised to accomplish the good works that God has in mind for you to do. We sometimes see our backstory as being filled with limitations, but he sees it as the foundation. Let me say it again. We often see it as a limitation, but he sees it as the foundation. And the enemy will tell you it's a limitation. Hey, what you faced, what you went through, what was done to you, those are all the reasons why you're disqualified, why, why, it's a li why you're limited to being able to be used by God, and you just got to stare back right into the enemy's face, and you got to say, no, that's not a limitation. That is a foundation for God to be use me because I'm perfectly poised because of this foundation to be used by God in profound ways in his bigger story. Okay, so now let's kind of fill in the story. After he kills the Egyptian, he runs in fear into the desert. And for 40 years, he's out in the desert. There he gets married, he has kids, but uh, God's not done with him. Remember, God has this very unique story that uh, his backstory is going to fill a, a part in. 
And so God is going to call him into a really amazing big assignment. And that call happens as God shows up to him in this burning bush. He sees this bush that's not being consumed by fire. He walks on over to it. God speaks to him out of the bush and, and he gives him kind of his assignment. Here it is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to lead them out of Egypt into their own uh, fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now this is what God is about and what God wants to do. And he's going to basically tell Moses, you're going to lead them in it. That entire picture of redeeming the people and saving them out of the oppression of of Pharaoh's hand is going to become your assignment, Moses. And so then Moses, what he does is he equips, or what God does is he equips Moses with a couple, I, I refer to him as like cool party tricks, but it's beyond that. He says, all right, take your, take your staff, throw it down on the ground. It'll turn into a snake. Put your hand into your cloak, and when it comes on out, it's covered in leprosy. Put it back in and bring it on out, and it'll, it'll be totally healed. And then you can take uh, water right out of the Nile River and drop it on the ground, and it will turn into blood. And you're going to use those really cool things to demonstrate to Pharaoh that I am a real God and I mean real business. And so that's exactly what Moses is ultimately going to do. But before he goes to do it, he says, God, I've got one problem. (laughs) And I would say it's the second thing that often can derail us of ever stepping into the bigger plan that God has for our lives. It's this. It's your feelings of inadequacy. And Moses is going to just point out how he feels really inadequate for the assignment that God has for him. In Exodus chapter four, verse, uh, or chapter four, verse 10, it says this. Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. Moses is saying, God... I hear your plan, I just think it's a bad plan (laughs) because you want me to be your spokesman and I don't spoke so good. That's what he's saying. He's like, this is, sounds, sounds nice. I'm just the wrong guy because the very thing you want me to do is the thing I really stink at. Have you ever felt that way in life? Like God's, you feel like God's calling you into something? God's calling you to, to work with two and three year olds in the nursery or in the kids ministry and you're like I don't I don't work with kids so well and yet he's calling you to do it God's calling you to lead a, a, a group a small group and you're like I don't know I feel like under equipped I don't feel like I can do that and yet God's calling you to do it God's calling you to serve in some capacity and you're like I don't feel like I can do that and yet God's calling you to do it here's the deal though um, we usually won't feel equipped for the things that God asks us to do You usually won't. Moses is actually going to beg God, come up with another plan. God basically goes, I'm not going to come up with another plan, but I will send you with a helper. Let's go grab your brother. And so he says, let's grab Aaron. And Aaron and you, he goes, I will speak to both of you, and I will instruct both of you in what to say. But he doesn't remove the assignment for him, even though Moses doesn't feel adequate to, to do it. And it's actually, this is often the a necessary part of the equation. We want to be a part of a God-sized story, but we want to do it with human comfort, right? I want to be a part of a God-sized story so long as I can remain comfortable and it's easy for me. And yet, that's not how it works. The necessary part of an equation for a God-sized story is that it requires God. Otherwise, in my case, it would be called a Josh-sized story. And I don't want to be a part of a Josh size story. That's something that I can come up with and I can dream and do on my own. But if it's something I can dream on my own and accomplish on my own, I'm aiming too low. God is going to set something that's really high for you that you can't accomplish on your own. And you're going to say, I'm inadequately not equipped for this. And he's going to say, that's right. Then you're perfectly set up for it. Your weakness is always a perfect platform for God to demonstrate his power in and through you. 
Maybe you've heard this story before. It's kind of a, a martial arts folklore story uh, that they, it's often told in those circles. And it, it kind of goes like this. There was once a, a young man who was missing his left arm. And he went to a dojo and he talked to the sensei and he said, is it possible that you can train me? Uh, and the sensei looked at him and he said, yeah, I can train you actually to be a, a judo champion, a judo master. And so he brought him on in. He started training him. And he started training him just in a lot of defensive moves, just defending himself, defend, defense, defense. And he said, let me teach you. I'm going to teach you one offensive move, only one. And so he started working on this one offensive move over and over and over again until he could just dial this thing in perfectly. The problem was because he wasn't learning all the other offensive moves and all the other you know, skills that go within uh, judo, he wasn't moving up through the ranks. So all of his classmates, everyone else, they're get, going up through the different belts and all the different colors and they're, and they're moving their way on up. And he's like, I'm not going anywhere because all I know how to do is defend myself and I got one move. And so he gets to a place where he's frustrated and he goes to the sensei and he's like, is, is this even worth it? I'll never be a judo master. I only know how to defend myself. I only know one move. And the sensei looked at him and he said, I think you're ready. Let's enter you in a tournament. So he entered him into a tournament. His very first match, he lines up against this guy and this guy starts coming at him. He's defending himself and there's like a split second moment where he can do his one offensive move. He does it, he takes the guy down, he wins, he wins the match. And that happens for the second match, the third match, the fourth and the fifth, and on, on and on until he makes it to the championship, the final match of the entire tournament. Even the, the ref looks at him and it's this little guy with one, with one arm against a, a judo champion, kind of master, uh, who's like twice his size and the, and the ref's like, we can't even let this thing happen. And the sensei said, let the fight happen. And so the, the fight starts happening, and it looks like this, this guy with one arm is just getting slaughtered. He's just getting beat on. He's just defending and defending, defending, defending himself, just trying to survive. And then all of a sudden, there's this one split-second moment where all of a sudden, he realizes, I can do my, my one offensive move. He does his move, he takes the guy down, and he wins the entire tournament. On the way home, he asks his sensei, he says, how is it possible that I was able to win that entire tournament? I don't only know how to defend myself. I only know one offensive move. And the sensei replied to him. He said, well, that one move, it's, like, it's one of the highest moves in all of judo. And the only known way to defend it is to trap the left arm. And so this, this guy, the very thing that he felt like was his greatest weakness is the one thing that made it, that he said, I'm going to use that. And maximize that thing. And I don't know where you feel weak. I don't know where you feel inadequate. But for God, he, he looks at your weakness. He looks at your inadequacies. And th- he goes, that's the place where I'm going to use you. So don't let your inadequacies, inadequacies rob you of stepping into God's bigger story that he might be writing in your life. Third, and you can always expect this, okay? So you got the backstory that you may not see the whole picture. You might have your limitations or where you feel inadequate. But the third is this, and we'll all face this. It's difficulties and discouragement. Every single one of us is going to face difficulties and discouragement along the way. And basically what ends up happening is Moses goes to Pharaoh, and his first difficulty, his first discouragement that he faces is he goes, he does his party tricks, he throws down his stick, it turns into a snake, he puts his hand into his cloak, comes out with leprosy, he goes back and he's healed. He turns the, the water from the Nile River into blood. He's like, ta-da, let my people go. And he sings the song. And Moses is like, no. He's like, what are you talking about, no? Did you not just see everything I just did? He's like, no. And so then God ends up sending a whole slew of these 10 plagues to kind of shake Pharaoh to the core and the Egyptians to the core, these 10 plagues of, uh, plagues of flies and frogs and boils and hail and blood and finally the death of the firstborn son. Pharaoh eventually breaks and he lets the Israelites go. And you would think that this is like a huge win, right? Huge win, Pharaoh's let the people go. Moses is gonna be like the greatest leader. This is gonna be one of those moments like Maui and Moana where the people are going, Moses, 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 you're awesome. And, you know, and Moses will be like, you're welcome. And, but that doesn't happen. Instead, as they're heading out of Egypt, they're heading across the desert, but something else happens. They start running out of food and they start running out of water. And this is what happens. Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. Then the whole community of Israel set out uh, from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of sin. By the way, if you're ever heading into a place called the wilderness of sin, just turn around. 
It's probably the title itself is the, is the giveaway that you should be aware uh, between Elam and, the Mount, and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. So they've had a month of enjoying freedom. But they're out there, and there too the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. They're not saying, look, these guys brought us out of Egypt. They're complaining. And they're saying, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. They moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and we ate till uh, all the bread that we wanted. But now you brought us into the wilderness to starve to death. You would think Moses would be like their greatest hero, but instead they're like, I can't believe you brought us out here to die. And here they are. Here Moses is facing discouragement. And here's the amazing thing about all this is that Moses is probably wondering, God, what are you doing? Like everyone hates me. The assignment is difficult. I'm feeling discouraged. But here's the deal. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean you're off track. Let me say it again. Just because it's difficult. Because are you aware Moses is doing the right thing, right? Right? He's not missing the mark here. He's doing the right thing, and yet he has the entire nation that he's led out of oppression, and they're all like, we hate that you brought us out here. (laughs) He's like, I'm doing the right thing. And so just because uh, you face difficulty doesn't mean that uh, you're off track. He's still on track. He's just facing difficulty and discouragement. God has a plan. He ends up providing for the Israelites food daily in the form of manna, bread that would land on the ground, meat, as well as water from the rock. So Moses strikes the rock, and God instructs him to strike the rock, and water pours out of a rock and, and for everyone to have enough drink. But then comes, I would say it's the most sobering part of the entire story. They're actually out in the desert. They've been out there now for years And it's the part that helps us see that you can actually live, are you aware, in part of God's big, extraordinary story, and you can actually miss out on part of it as well. Because that's ultimately what happens for Moses. He won't end up um, being able to lead the people into the promised land because of something that happens. Here's what's going on. They've been in the desert for years. At this point, they actually have a tabernacle where they worship God. Uh, He's given them the Old Testament laws, the Ten Commandments, you know, a bunch of the Old Testament laws. Moses' wife eventually dies. and, um, And they move to a new place. They kind of, everyone pack up camp. They move to a new place. And once again, as they arrive in this new place, they're without water. And the people, once again, this is in Numbers chapter 20, the people blame Moses and they say, if only we had died back in Egypt. This is once again, years later. So now God tells Moses to do this in Numbers chapter 20, verse 8 through 12. He says, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, as the people watch speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. And you will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned all the people to come and and gathered at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand. He struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But... The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. Okay, so now question, what in the world just happened? Because it kind of looks like they did what was right, but then it clearly, they did something wrong because the result is they're being punished and they're not gonna be able to lead the people into the promised land. Okay, so question, what did God tell them to do? God told them, Speak to the rock, right? What did Moses do? He hit the rock. You might be like, what's the big difference? Speaking versus hitting the rock? Here's what happened. You want to know what happened? Moses' pride happened. And it's really the fourth thing that we've got to be aware of. It's our pride that can be the stumbling block. It can be the trap that actually can rob you of being able to walk in the beautiful plan that God has for you. I say it's Moses' pride, his cockiness, that will keep him out of the promised land. And we know that it's his pride because in verse 10, he says this. He says, must we bring you water? Must we bring you water? Do, 
Look, guys, everyone gather around, all you rebels. Do I have to provide for you again? Must we, as opposed to, must God show up for you again? Must God demonstrate his faithfulness to you again? Was God not doing it before him? Will God not do it again? No, in this case, he goes, hey guys, must I provide for you again? Watch this, tap, tap. And because he does it in his own way, what does he do? He says, I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to make the story about me. As opposed to doing it God's way and making the story about him. And his pride gets in the way and as a result, God says, because you did not honor me as holy in front of the whole nation right now, you will not take the people into the promised land. That portion, it's the finale of the assignment, is going to get passed to Joshua who will end up leading the people into Israel. It's an incredibly sobering moment in Moses' entire life right here where so much has gone well, but in this moment he misses it. And because of how he missed this trap, he actually misses out on the finale of the whole story, at least him being able to lead the people into it. From our big dog this week, God takes, really, he takes this ordinary guy on an adventure of extraordinary things. And all the way along the way, uh, the enemy is trying to rob him constantly of the story that God wants to write in his life. And he does some right and he does some wrong. He sees a lot of God's story written, but he also misses out on the final chapter. How about you? Out of these common traps that rob us of the plan that God uh, wants to do in your life, are you being trapped? Are you falling into any of these traps? Do you have, yes, a limited picture of the bigger picture of what God is doing, and you've seen your life experiences as a limitation, not a foundation. How about um, maybe places where you feel inadequate? You feel like God has called you to do something, but you're like, I don't have the skills. I don't have the giftings. I feel inadequate, and so you haven't stepped into it. Or maybe you've just faced difficulty along the way, or discouragement, or maybe it's your own pride. A couple months ago, I was in California. I was uh, picking up my daughter uh, from school, and we were coming back. But I, was at, I went to In-N-Out Burger. I was by myself. She was out for the day. And so I was having uh, lunch there. And when I finished having lunch at dinner now, I was like, oh, I got to use the restroom. And so I walked into the restroom and I walked in there and I looked around and there were no urinals. And I thought, this is really strange. I was like, but I am in California. Who knows? So I was like, it's just a bunch of stalls. So I went on into a stall and I did what I came to do. Um, and while I'm there, I look around. There's like one of these like, you know, like the little uh, garbage cans on the side in there. I was like, that's like really strange. Like guys, they don't put little, those little dispos, you know, for women's products in the guys' rooms. And I'm sitting there doing what I'm called to do in that place. And, um, and all of a sudden it hits me. There was no urinals out there. There's a little garbage can right there. I'm like, oh no. I am in the wrong place. Well, you can't stop when you're in the middle of what you're doing. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm like, immediately I start listening around. I'm like, is there anyone else in here with me? Because I'm like, I start sweating bullets. I was like, at this point, I'm like, I just got to get out, you know? And so I'm, I, I, I get out of, out of the stall and I go to wash my hands. I'm not gross. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm washing my hands as fast as I possibly can. I'm like, I just got to get out of here. All of a sudden, the door swings wide open. This woman starts walking in and she sees me and she screams. And I was like... I looked at her, I was like, I, I'm like, and she immediately backs up. She looks at the sign on the wall to make sure that she didn't get it right. I look at her, I was like, you got it right. I got it wrong. I dropped my head and I'm telling you, I just walked as fast out of that in and out burger as I possibly could. I was just like, I was so embarrassed that I was, that I was in the women's bathroom. But here's the deal. I don't know if you've ever experienced, you probably haven't experienced that in life, but I don't know if you've ever experienced where all of a sudden you have this aha moment where literally in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I don't know if you've ever experienced that where you're like, I, had, I, I didn't even realize how I got here, but all of a sudden I'm acutely aware I am in the wrong place. And somehow I ended up here. And the same thing happens, though, in our spiritual journey where God has an assignment for you. And sometimes what happens is all of a sudden, maybe this morning, you're having an aha moment where you're like, I can't believe that I am here this morning. And you're having an awakening going, I'm in the wrong place. How did I get here? And you're realizing, oh, I've, and it's really quick. You can kind of backtrack and be like, oh, I am here 
off track today because I've allowed my backstory to constantly be a limitation. Every time the Lord called me into something, I said, here's why I can't do it. Here's why I'm not qualified. Here's why. And I use those, all those excuses. And all of a sudden you find yourself, you're in the wrong place. You're not in the place that God has for you, a plan that he has for you. And you're all of a sudden just aware. Oh man, I, I, I didn't take a step forward because I always used my lack of abilities as my excuse. Or uh, the first time I faced difficulty, I used it as an excuse. And all of a sudden I find myself, here's where I'm at in my life. And I was never meant to be here. And so my prayer for you, maybe it's today, maybe it's this week, that you have an aha moment if you are off track, that all of a sudden you would wake up and be like, I'm not supposed to be here. And then you don't want to know what you do, beeline it out of there and get in, in line with God. Are you with me here? And we're gonna, so we're, we're gonna identify, hey, here's some of these common traps. If you fall into them, it's time to call it out and move on, get out of that place and get in line with God. Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Oh, Jesus. Thanks for our big dog, Moses. He did a lot right. He did a, a little wrong. He got to live out most of the big story and be a part of it. And unfortunately, he missed out on the final chapter. God, can we learn? Can each and every one of us learn from some of these common traps that the enemy will want to try to remind us of or tell or speak over us? Maybe we're having an aha moment today, maybe an aha moment later this week where we're just gonna go like, I was never supposed to be here. But I've allowed some of these other traps to land me here. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna take a step forward. I'm gonna get out of it. I'm gonna walk in step with you. I wanna get in line with you and the big story that you're writing in my life. And so, Lord, have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, we'd love to pray with you. If there's anything heavy on your heart that you're facing this week, we all have prayer partners down here on the front. Uh, also, they're online. If you want to give to support the ministries here, there's boxes in the back. There's ways to give online. Otherwise, be blessed. We'll see you guys next week. Hi. So I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. So out of those four points that you yeah. made today, what do you think is the most common? Most common. Yeah, good question. I think um, I think all of us deal with all of them at some point. So yeah. it's like you when you look at it, I mean, Moses dealt with all of them. Right. Um, so at some point, we're all going to probably face every single one of those. Mm -hmm. But I would say the most common that probably you'll you'll be able to even pinpoint it even in your own life is that third point, which is discouragement or difficulties. Like yeah. we all face difficulties and discouragement mm -hmm. along the way. But the crazy thing in, even in Moses's story, he faces it when he's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that's like how it often yeah. is. Like I, I'm, I thought I'm doing the right thing. And all of a sudden it's not working out. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times we would think, Hey, if, um, if I'm doing the right thing, if God calls me to do this, it will be successful. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We get this approach this idea like, well, surely God's favor will be on it. Yeah. God's favor was on it mm -hmm. and the people rejected him and mm -hmm. the people rebelled and the people complained and and they're like, why'd you bring us out here? We hate you, you know? Yeah, and, right. <laughs> and so you look at it and I'm like, man, that's I think that most common one because you can feel like you're doing it all right mm -hmm. and you might be. This is why it's so important that you know that you know that you know Mm -hmm. that God's called me to do this, X, Y, Z, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, because when difficulty comes, because I don't think it's an if, I think it's a when, mm -hmm. you have to know like, hey, I'm, I'm facing difficulty, but God called me to it. I'm going to press through. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so good. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you guys are in need of prayer or if you guys are looking to do some next steps, you guys can drop that down in the chat below. We love you guys and we'll see you next week.